Typography leads to me collecting a lot of random things because they catch my eye. And it's the nature of being fairly serious about typography that as I collect things and they pile up, I start thinking and questions come together and proper investigation starts. Um, and so I'm talking about kind of what's been sort of a long simmering project that came together that way. That started with coming across uh, picture of a magazine cover on Tumblr at some point. Um, but it's an example of using the typeface Stilla by Francois Boltana, which was released by Letraset. And I always loved the typeface and almost never found examples of it in use. And I was so excited to discover this sort of great example of it in a genre of publishing where I would not expect fairly sensitive typography. Um, and I was trying to recreate it for a project that I had in mind and realized that I could not set that particular group of letters and match it. And I was curious about like, oh, of course, the, this is a much better version of the L, but where did that come from? Like, was this just sort of a, it seemed improbable that an adult magazine had a skilled art director lettering artist who redrew the title. Um, so I went into my source material for Letraset, the old catalogs, just to double check. And sure enough, Letraset did publish um, alternate versions of many of the characters that didn't make it into the digital fonts that I had available to work with. Um, and this made a lot of sense. This is sort of a great way of taking advantage of how you worked with rub down type, where every letter was set very consciously and you're making choices all along the way. It was inherent in the process. Um, and it's just, you know, it's something I began filing away. Is like, oh yeah, I guess it would make sense. It was this whole era of publishing where Letraset and other kinds of rub down type are the dominant means of making things. So it would lead you to certain type choices and some sort of solutions would come much more easily than they would later on when there were uh, digital typesetting methods or even earlier when there was uh, just photo typesetting coming off of film strips. And then I came across another example of a magazine on Tumblr that blew me away because this is also not what you would expect from some very mature content. Um, like this exuberant um, and fairly like well thought out mix of typefaces um, to convey this very adult material. And looking at it, as, again, this is sort of like, this could have been like a letter set specimen poster, promotional poster. It's like mixing together so many of their typefaces. So these, you know, filed away and the questions were percolating in my mind for a long time. Um, and I began really looking at more and more material as I came across it, gathering things out of like, you know, old bookstores or piles of junk that I would come across. Um, but I began thinking about the nature of where things like Letraset fit into type history. I mean, this is another whole area of investigation that I've spoken at before, but what does it mean to set type a certain way and have certain means of working with type available to you and what kind of uh, results come out of that? So I began looking at this sort of, you know, narrow band of the publishing world uh, and, um, really considering how are these put together. Um, it's pretty easy when you start with just something like Letraset, a very successful um, distributor of type material during a certain era of publishing in the 60s and 70s. Um, and it didn't take much to see where these typefaces came from when you see them peppered across the mastheads of many magazines. Um, and, you know, sometimes they are like fairly blunt choices. Guess what this typeface is called? Frankfurter. But, you know, I have to admit, that's actually set pretty well. 
And this is inherent in the nature of what you have to do with Letraset. Um, you know, someone is starting from nothing and laying the, the text down letter by letter. Um, they are making the spacing decisions one by one as they go along. So even if you are working in sort of, you know, the fringe area of the publishing world, you have to have a modicum of skill just in order to get anything done. This is workaday graphic design work, workaday typography, but it was a way of working where you would naturally develop a certain kind of sensitivity because you could either function or not. Um, and I could see many surprising choices in typefaces as I would go down this, like who would expect to see this sort of exuberant French typeface, you know, on the cover of, you know, hardcore pornography. And there's something, there was sort of a spirit coming out of this, is that there were these designers cranking out material in sort of the seedy edges of an industry who were still relishing the opportunity to just pick something that, you know, had a little bit of playfulness to it, had a little bit of flair, and that did require a certain amount of sensitivity to how it was used in order to come to the results. And it's pretty obvious once you've looked at a lot of how a rub down type is used, how often and how pervasive this was. But interestingly, this is like not, while there are moments of great inventiveness and playfulness, not the most well resolved typography. When you zoom in on a lot of this, like that headline, Rough and Ready, completely obvious to me that it was done with letter set when you zoom in. The alignment is only so-so, that apostrophe is sitting in a place that would not be like placed there in a, you know, a fully resolved font. Someone was laying this down letter by letter with a certain amount of sensitivity that comes with doing the craft all the time. Um, and we see that kind of again and again as I gathered these covers and looked at the details and tried to parse how they would have been typeset, what were the production methods like in this area. Again, you see um, Optima, very, very successful typeface used uh, for letter sets. Um, alignments, almost but not quite there. Uh, letter spacing, almost but not quite there, but fairly tight, which definitely comes more from the rub down aesthetic than uh, what would be built into the fonts themselves. So these clues began piling up and you get a sense of like, what were the designers cranking out these magazines? What were the tools at their disposal? What were their reproduction methods they were doing? Um, and there's a story that begins coming out of it the more that I started paying attention to how this material was put together. Um, there'd be a lot of clues looking at magazines, even those that were a little bit better resolved in terms of design, um, in just the materials that they had at the ready. Once again, if you see this uh, typeface, Letraset Compacta, which is like a hallmark of the era, is wildly successful for the company. It was designed to be a very efficient headline typeface. Um, and when I see it here, this is set pretty well. Um, it had to have been done with Letraset. There are a couple of hallmarks in the details of how it's being handled, but this is being done by a designer who has a pretty good sense of visual alignment, pretty good sense of, of uh, letter spacing as they're resolving it, and is working with at least the color and the materials in an inventive way, trying to elevate the material. Um, <clears throat> but this notion was inherent with Letraset the product. They realized pretty soon after um, they launched that Letraset was a material for the casual user, someone who did not have access or uh, did not have the time to go to professional typesetting agencies to get galleys of type that would be put down for mechanicals. Um, and this is very powerful in these sort of fringe areas of publishing. I mean, I'm looking at it in the case of erotica, which was still very much in the era. Um, this, was, this was, like I said, the seedy dark edges of the publishing industry. But you also see it a lot in a lot of areas of publishing um, where the social history of the means of production are very important. Um, the, all the material that uh, the Black Panther movement was pushing out, um, 
the punk movement came out of having this immediate access to the means of production without going through record companies or established magazines or publishers. Um, this is something really powerful about the democratization of the typesetting tools. When you could go into an art supply store, get a little bit of rub down type, um, put together a layout yourself that could be photocopied or taken to a printer. It's you know one less middleman in there that may say, oh, we're not, we don't want to handle this. We're a little bit worried about this. It may be illegal or it may be scandalous. Um, there's a directness to the means of production and the means of typesetting that empowered a lot of publishing and empowered a lot of people to get their word out. This became the compelling argument of looking at a lot of this adult material for me. Not so much, you know, the way it started was like, ha ha ha, that's funny that they would use these, these cool display typefaces in these dirty magazines, but more, these dirty magazines were coming out of um, what was a pretty restrictive cultural space. And the means of production made it possible for them to, you know, put that joy and that playfulness into it. Um, but they grew out of a very furtive place, um, particularly for, um, the space of publishing that dealt with homosexuality. Um, the background of this material earlier in the 20th century was that uh, homosexuality uh, in the United States, in Britain, which is where most of my source material came from, was illegal. Um, when it could not be directly illegal, many, many means were employed to crack down on it in various ways. Particularly in the space of publishing, there were um, postal restrictions in the United States against the mailing of obscenity through the Postal Service. And that was used to really, really restrict um, uh, cultural materials from groups that were, you know, were oppressed. Uh, if something had a whiff of homosexuality about it, it would be branded as obscenity and it could be cracked down at the federal level um, if it was mailed. So, even before we get into the era of decriminalization and sort of the growing acceptance of homosexuality, um, you see in earlier publications this sort of like careful shading of language, um, communicating what's going on to the, to the target audiences, but defensible in court as being fine. Um, you see it a lot, uh, particularly in the mid-century with physique magazines. Um, magazines that could be defended to say, it's like, oh, this is about exercise. This is about a, a healthy lifestyle. Um, this is about uh, classical posing for the benefit of artists and uh, photographers who want to practice their craft. Um, for the audiences that these magazines were being sold to, either fairly discreetly over newsstands or more often through the post, there was a very clear message about this was linking together a community that was existing in, in the shadows, living in the underground. Um, the sh the, it's hard to see in this slide because it's printed in orange ink for a little bit pizzazz, but um, uh, the Grecian Guild pictorial magazine had this opening paragraph. The Grecian Guild is a brotherhood of bodybuilders, artists, physique students, and others dedicated to the radiant health of body, mind, and spirit, which frees men from the vulgar and base and inspires him to noble ideals and endeavors. This was a magazine to show guys in their underwear, sold to guys who wanted to see pictures of guys in their underwear. And this was the the context from which the actual liberation movement began pushing against communities who are feeling empowered to say, it's like, no, we exist. It's unjust that our existence is illegal. Um, the Manischian Review was published out of New York City by um, a group that came together to combat the criminalization of homosexuality. And, you know, so they were really fighting against um, the risk of being arrested for gathering, for publishing material about what they wanted to discuss. And this is from 1955, but you can see if you inspect the material evidence of what they're doing, they were working with whatever means they had at hand. Um, they're setting text with typewriters. They're very cheap one color printing. 
Um, but they're trying to make it look respectable. They're trying to lay it out like it looks like a magazine you may get. Um, they're trying to rise to the level of what could be published professionally around them to say, we are respectable. Uh, we are no worse than anyone else. Um, moving more into sort of the fringes of the publishing going around, we get into uh, publishers who are trying to move past this fiction of the physique magazine and say, or being much closer to being more open about what their intentions were. Uh, we're a community that's, that's bound by our sexual desires. We want to be open about that and, you know, share this material and find others like us in the community. So um, Mars, which was a magazine um, published by Chris Studio, a uh, photography studio in Chicago run by a guy named Chuck Renslow and his partner, um, uh, who, who did illustrations under the name Etienne, um, was putting together this little magazine, very cheaply done, putting a fair amount of playful invention into the layouts and the art direction, trying to make the most with a little bit hand. And again, you see pretty basic photo type setting for passages of text, a lot of rub down type to do the more decorative stuff. Physique Pictorial was a more famous uh, physique magazine out of mid-century United States, but um, was being published by <clears throat> a guy named Bob Miser, who's a photographer who had less graphic capabilities um, in his own background to work with. And I mean, Physique Pictorial, you can see the scissor marks of the prints that were cut out and pasted together. And you can see him laying in type from almost any way that he was able to put it together. Um, and the pages are rough, but there's a vitality to them that I still really appreciate. I mean, this is like precursors of punk photography to me. This is someone who wants to get the word out and can't go to a professional typesetter, can't go to a respectable printer who's going to give him advice about how to do color stripping and perfect his layouts. Um, but this is very influential. I mean, this was a magazine that was distributed across the USA by post, was fighting against the postal censorship at the federal level and trying to declare there's nothing wrong with what we do. And physique pictorial was one of the key things in uh, the case to decriminalize um, the ability to send adult material through the post in the US. And you can sort of see in its later years where it could be much more risque in what it produced, it was still going for like the cheapest means of production possible because this is still publishing on the margins. There's not a lot of money. There's still a lot of social pressure not to make this available. And I love, it's a little bit fuzzy in the photo, but this early, uh, you know, this early digital print of trying to use still a little bit of zest for the title typography mixed in with some Times New Roman laid down with Letraset. Um, and it's fascinating for me to pick apart the story of how these publications were put together because that social history I think is very critical and worth considering within the field of graphic design. What were the people who didn't have all the training but at this point have the same means of production available to them trying to accomplish? What were they aspiring to do? So we get to Drummer, which is being published now in the mid-70s, uh, past the era of the decriminalization of sending adult material through the post in the United States. Um, in the, you know, the full flower of the age of um, uh, you know, homosexuality being more socially acceptable, um, uh, far less uh, subject to uh, police pressure while there was still plenty. Drummer was, was existing in a very particular space. This was like the really, what they were proud to declare, the dark underground of the gay world. Uh, this is the world of s &M. This is like, this is some serious hardcore stuff. But they were trying to elevate the material once again, pull a community together and establish some pride for that community and say, you know, it's like we're not rats scurrying the underbelly, uh, you know, we exist once again. And Drummer is an ongoing mystery to me because it was published under a few different editors. Um, the material was put together. There are different art directors for different issues. Um, 
there's not much of a, of a thread pulling through what Drummer was doing over the years, except for the fact that it was interesting and it was surprisingly visually sophisticated for what the material was about. I mean, I love these playful letter set um, mashups that they were doing of throwing all these typefaces together in kind of a joyous way um, because it was, you do, again, you don't expect like jokes and winks um, in this space and it's delightful to see them and interesting to say that this is what they were trying to do was kind of claim a broader uh, feeling for the culture. Um, and even for a magazine that was you know, sold on newsstands, probably under covers slightly hidden by shelves or brown wrappers, but um, definitely sold through subscription and used to knit a community together, um, th there was a lot of versatility to what they were trying to show. There's some sort of constant reinvention to the covers. Um, and presenting not what you would expect, challenging even the audience that they were reaching out to and try to pull together to say like, you're a sophisticated reader. It doesn't matter like that what you're into is vilified by other people, you know, this is something for you to enjoy nevertheless. But again, you look at the details and you can decode the means of production available to them still. This is not the best, most professional typesetting. Um, that table of contents is in a very, very blurry setting of Optima, coming from some uh, photo typesetter that was not the best quality. You see the crispness in the reproduction from what was laid down by Letraset, a quality more inherent in the material of the art director just laying the letters down on the mechanical boards. Um, and I think when you're familiar with the means of production, you can almost build the mechanical paste up in your head as you see the quality of the type the photo stats for the high contrast uh, graphic art reproduction um, mixed with all these pieces being put together. Um, and Drummer was part of a small publishing empire. They were taking this versatility and uh, extending it to partner magazines and special issues and annuals. And they are still having fun with it. Um, this is using um, Onli and ITC Fatface, which again, these are sort of like elegant and playful and eccentric typefaces. These are not like hard men's typefaces. There's delicacy to this that is providing a sense of contrast. That's fairly sophisticated design thinking for a stroke mag, if we want to think of these as such. Um, and you know, there's a lot of mundane typesetting and typography inside, but still, again, if you are doing any kind of layout, any kind of typesetting in this era, you had to know a little bit about what you were doing. You had to have some kind of training in just how to use the materials and what it was all about. And you can see that coming out even in these simple gestures to be a little bit playful. Um, and you know, there, there are moments where it's like, okay, yeah, you're working with an idea, you are playing with the materials being made available to you, like, good for you. You're trying to show that this is sophisticated. This isn't worth just being, you know, like thrown in the trash. Um, Drummer is also interesting from an editorial stance because it was very literary. This is a very text intensive magazine. There was a lot of original illustration work in cartoons. Um, it was trying to pull together book reviews and film reviews and theater reviews and just run it through the filter of the community that it was gathering together. Drummer, like a lot of these magazines that I've been gathering, is still suffering from operating on a shoestring. And as the means of production changed, the results were less and less compelling. The switch to digital typography was not very uh, impressive for most of this entire publishing sector. And you can see it, again, if you're familiar with how these things came together. Suddenly, they're not using Letraset. They're using a lot of Helvetica as ships with Mac OS, and they're applying color effects um, because they're easy to set up in the software. Um, but there's still at least like a hint of an attempt to build upon what they've been done. They're using 
you know, a version of an old logo type that was still originally put together with Letraset and retouched and re-photocopied and reproduced over the years. They're just layering on the new production methods that were becoming available. But even that was like deteriorating year over year until they're just knocking someone out or knocking something out from someone who knows how to use the Mac knows how to send a file to uh, the printer. The quality of the photography was deteriorating. The typesetting was just really an uninventive disaster at this point. And you see it across a lot of these magazines whose model had shifted from being less about community to more to, we've just got to get some money, let's print some dirty pictures, and you know, you'll, put, you'll put a headline on there so it'll be on the newsstand. And that's kind of a shame to me that with the shift in the means of production, that modicum of skill that kind of inherently came with some create, creative thinking was lost. As the tools became better democratized, you needed less and less sensitivity just to get something out, and you can see the, the deterioration in the results over the years. So this all, you know, was moving in and out of a project that had been uh, simmering in the background for me for a long time. I published this little zine called Pink Mints. This has been sort of a sanity side project of mine for many years. And I had wanted to do something about this interesting typographic context that I was seeing in adult magazines. Um, and I didn't want it to be about the porn. Um, I just wanted to look out what was the typography like? What typography was being practiced within the sphere of publishing? What like sensitivity to composition of the page and the handling of type was actually being practiced here in the skin trade? Um, so I wanted to recreate the covers of these magazines that were striking me and recreate them as exactly as humanly possible. Um, so I tracked down as many of the typefaces that I could, uh, particularly I was trying to focus on what was digitally available so I could actually produce them in an efficient way with today's means of production. Um, but I would lay them over photographs of the original and reset them letter by letter um, and really match the quality of what was happening and do some essentially historical research through the recreation of that. And it was amazingly easy to parse how things are put together by doing this. When you are replicating the letter spacing, it's very easy to tell if something was done with letter sets or other kinds of rub down type, or if it was done by photo type setting where the spacing was wonky, but it would be consistent at least if it's coming out of a type setting system that had things prepared. Um, the digital, the early digital things were actually quite obvious as well, again, because the spacing would match the fonts that I had available to work with. So this is an interesting kind of typographic archaeology that was fascinating to me that came out of like this visual joke that I wanted to execute at first and really began this march along down to un, un, you know, unspooling what the social history was all about. So for instance, when I, I had to do the cover of Bold, which started this whole years long journey, and in the end, I had to draw that letter L. It doesn't exist in the digital version of Stilla that you can get today. I've had a little practice drawing letters, so it was easy enough to knock it out. But the same thing, like those letters were combined very sensitively, and it's definitely not the way that happens if you just type out the word Bold with an exclamation point in the digital version of Stilla. There's a, even uh, in terms of the vertical positioning of the letters, there is some sensitivity applied to how those combined. Um, and most of these magazines all have like a Helvetica stra strap line on there somewhere that says like adults only, collector's edition or the price. And all of that Helvetica uh, almost like to, to the every one came from a photo typeset version that had fairly consistent but kind of wonky spacing compared to the later digital versions. Um, recreating the drummer uh, covers was actually often quite hard because they used so many typefaces and not all of them from sources I could identify. Things like Onley and Fatface I recognized as Letraset faces and happily most of the Letraset catalog um, is available in the digital form. Um, but 
as I uncovered all the details of many of these, I realized that a lot of these magazines were pretty artful mixes of more typefaces than would be considered tasteful. I mean, lots of these covers you're seeing, they're like, you know, five or six typefaces being merged together in ways that are not immediately obvious. Sometimes the investigation came down to realize, like, oh, the price is set in a totally different typeface. You're identifying something by a single number and maybe a dollar sign. But I couldn't argue in most cases that, oh, it's the right choice to, like, pull back and go for this different tone and personality. Sometimes uh, I couldn't identify the right typeface. There have been so many dot matrix typefaces produced by every photo type shop. Um, uh, Letraset had a couple of variants. I could not do the right one, but luckily these are easy to knock out, so I did this typeface that matched the original source in two hours one morning and just, you know, could easily extrapolate the whole alphabet. And I'm sure someday I'll probably just finish this. Uh, punk, you know, currency marks are really weird for designs like this, especially the newer ones. But um, the, I was happy that, you know, there's a better digital version um, based on Calypso available now, so I was able to do this. But again, like, you wouldn't immediately look at this and realize that there were five typefaces all thrown together. Um, and, you know, here, so this is an earlier magazine. This is uh, before Letraset became like a dominant graphic material in the industry. So you see a lot of this terribly spaced photo typesetting used for all of the small text. Um, <clears throat> and that typeface, you know, that's coming from the rubdown type is just used for the big stuff. Someone bought a couple of sheets, knocked out some decorative type, and is still working with fairly traditional means of production of laying things down. Later on, um, where you're getting into some more ambitious magazines that are trying to charge more premium prices for their content, you know, this took so long to do, and it would have taken just as long to do for the designer who was working with all of that avant-garde, and who had the sensitivity to say, you know, it's like Aachen has better numbers than avant-garde for me to want, want to show the price. Or, no, I'm sorry, is Futura using for the numbers? Aachen was for the title. Um, but even like look at the sensitivity of that little apostrophe of saying it's like, you know what? We're just gonna like lay down a Futura apostrophe, knock it out of the title because I would get better density of the letters. This kind of, you know, attention to detail is not coming out of the people who are knocking things out in PageMaker and Quark Express even a few years later. Um, sometimes there's just sort of a striking, like, use of composition and the mix of, like, exactly the right two typefaces to get the effect across. And this sort of, like, this inventive thinking is what really struck me when you isolate the art direction of these magazines from essentially the content which was all most of the customers cared about. This is the notion of what is graphic design and typography about? How are you influencing people at a level that they are not consciously making their choices about? You know, the audience for these publications are looking at the pictures. Let's, let's all be very frank about that. They were not really buying them for the articles. But you know what? Someone is still employed to say, I have to make them choose this magazine over the next one. What's, what's at my disposal to work with? Um, and you know, as the years go by, you see less sensitivity to that. This is straight up Gil Sands ultra bold digital version, like nothing really being done to be a little bit smarter about how it's handled. And it's a real shame. I kind of love it because I love this eccentric, weird bananas typeface, but I wish it would have been handled with some of the, some of the artfulness um, of some of these earlier magazines that were using the rub down type where you couldn't get away with not being very artful because it would either be absolutely terrible or handled with a certain amount of finesse and resolution. So a couple of just like side things within this to pull this story around. As I said, I love Francois Boltana's Stilla. I just, it's a beautiful assortment of letters, very difficult to work with, and I've almost never found examples of it in use. Like I've looked and looked, I've seen a couple of record covers, I once found it on a building, suddenly I began digging into this particular area of publishing, Stilla. 
stilla, stilla, stilla. It seems a weird choice for the material, but it's all over the place. Um, and I'm glad it's found a home. I'm glad that it was being handled by designers who actually appreciated the shapes of these letters and knew to handle them with a certain amount of care. I think it's an odd legacy for Stilla, certainly, but you know, thank goodness it's out there. And this was a terrible magazine, ugly in all ways, but as you can guess, I pounced on it the second I found it because of the title, which I thought was funny in its own when I was looking for a title for the talk. And it was about six months later that I actually opened up the magazine and realized that this is the only piece of adult material I'd ever encountered where the scenario was the excitement of being in the print shop and the heated state of passion it can get you into. And this is like the only, only spread from the magazine that could be shown in public. But it's nice knowing that again, someone was having their private little joke and saying it's like, I know exactly where we should set this next scenario. Let's do it. Uh, thank you very much for bearing with me for all of this. Thank you.